I'm Kate Masters for the Frederick News Post, and this is Beyond the Ballot, a series of in-depth interviews with Frederick County's most recently elected officials. And I am here today with uh, Delegate Barry Siliberti, and you are entering, it's your second term as representative for District 4? Correct. Okay. And tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, sorry. No, no. Actually, it's my third term. Right. Because the first term was the last century. Okay. <laughs> and I represented uh, Montgomery County, okay. Montgomery Village from 1995 through 99. Okay. And um, the people had said at that point, that's enough. So I left uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, subsequently we moved to, to Frederick. So we've been here for about 16 years. Okay, great. I, yeah. I was gonna ask you actually how you came to live in Frederick County. Yeah. Decided Montgomery was not what we wanted, so we bailed out. Mm -hmm. And why was that? You know, when the county council passes a law that tells me when I have to shovel snow, mm -hmm. That's insulting. Oh. I think I know when to shovel snow. I think I know I have to keep these sidewalks clear and that and a couple of other things. And uh, so that was enough. Okay, too much interference. Yeah, absolutely, wanted... TMG, too much government. Okay. <laughs> That's my motto, incidentally. Mm -hmm. And then you are also a college professor, are you not? Bowie State. Bowie State? Yeah, I was at the University of Maryland College Park for about 14 years. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed that very much, government and history. And, uh, and I have been at Bowie State for 35 years. Oh, wow. Teacher training, yeah. Okay, and so are you teaching teachers then? Trying to. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's getting more, <laughs> getting more difficult. Really, why but, is that? Uh, candidly, what's coming out of public education uh, uh, is, is um, it, they're getting weaker and weaker in terms of basic knowledge, hmm. uh, especially American history, American government. When you put a map of the United States into the hands of a college, a sophomore or junior in college, and the best you're getting is 10 or 12 states back, we got a problem. Oh, interesting. You know, well, tragic. Yeah. And then, not to bore you, but when you ask them, what are some of the great documents in American history, uh, well, they, they do come up with a constitution. That's good. They don't know when it was or how it happened, but they know the constitution. <laughs> Enough. Okay. So how do you, like as a professor, how do you combat that then, if you're seeing this gap in drill. knowledge? Drill. It's, it's one of the key components. Uh, introduce them to it uh, and uh, don't assume that the first time you did it, it's going to stick. Mm -hmm. So repetition is uh, one of those tools that we have for uh, imparting knowledge. And I told them point blank, you know, I said at the midterm, I, I want 35 states. And we got 35 states because I, 10 points would come off. By the time we had the final, they were doing 40 of them. So. Game over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and do you still teach um, history and government at Bowie State as no, well? No, just a teacher training. Just teacher training. Yeah. The um, what happened at uh, UMUC was that uh, we used to do F FTF face to face, mm -hmm. which I loved the classroom. And then my director said, "Well, we're doing something different now, uh, Celebrity. You're going to be doing a hybrid, which means you'll meet the students on Monday or whenever, but the rest is on computers." And I said, computers starting with a capital C, yes. So I tried that and um, not very happy with it, but it worked. And then he said, uh, called me one day and he said, I have good news. I said, I'll determine that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said, we're going to move from 14 weeks to eight weeks. In I terms said, really? of class said, length? Class time, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, by the way, we're all going computers. So Kate, uh, after one semester, uh, I don't like computers. Worst, I can't deal with the act with the absence of a classroom. There's too much uh, inner dynamics that goes on in there. So I, I resigned. Oh, interesting. Yeah, didn't want to, but no sense cheating the students. Okay. Or frustrating, raising my blood pressure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that you mentioned that your first term as delegate was in the '90s. Ninety-five. And so I wanted, I wanted, to, or I wanted to know what you know made you want to run for office and translate you know that knowledge of government and history into an elected position. Yes, I've been asked that a lot, and um, I've always wanted to serve. I've always wanted to be part of the uh, the governmental mix that could could help people, sounds corny, it's a fact, help people and possibly pass some legislation that would continue to help not only the, the locals but the states. And, uh, you know, that flies such in the face of my family. From this standpoint, I'll share this with you. Mm -hmm. My dad, who was a surgeon and a physician, we were talking one night at the dinner table and he said, uh, and he was involved in politics in Philadelphia. 
Camden. He said, Barry, I want you to make me one promise. That's just one. He said, don't get involved in politics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dad, mm -hmm. I'll see what I could do. And here we are. So I, I'm sure he understands. Yeah. Okay. And so you grew up in the Philadelphia area. Camden and Philly. You know, when Camden was a nice town. Mm -hmm. you know, today, it's, I think it's the murder capital of the world. Yeah, or I know second having... to Detroit. Yeah. yeah. But Philly was, was and is a great town. Okay. I love it. Okay. And then you, you moved to Maryland. Yes. Then say about 16 years ago, you moved back up to Frederick County. Correct. And then you also, in 2014, you campaigned for delegate again. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I lost. You lost, yeah. <laughs> but, and then, I mean, why do you think you lost that campaign? Um, I was asked by a friend of mine who was going to run for the state senate if I would consider running, and this was sometime the end of February. And the, uh, the primary was in June. And uh, I said yes. But to make a long story short, we didn't start campaigning until about the uh, end of April, first part of May. It's not an excuse. That's my wife. That's why, well, that's the reason my wife told me I lost. <laughs> because we didn't have enough time to campaign, but I did lose. Yeah. yeah. And then were you expecting, because that seat opened up again when I think it was then Delegate Kelly Schultz. Kelly left. Schultz was picked to be part of uh, Hogan's cabinet. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of reasons, I thought that was a wise choice. Mm -hmm. Not that I had any indication of, of taking the seat, but then uh, some close friends of mine said, look, you've got to file again with the central committees. So I did. And uh, Frederick County uh, Central Committee uh, nominated me singularly out of four people. And I had to go to Carroll County. And uh, they nominated four people or three, and it went to Governor Hogan. And Governor Hogan called me in my office at Bowie at 2.30 in the afternoon and said he wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Ball game over. Wow. What did that feel like? <laughs> Terrific. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, you know, it's something that you wanted. You had a chance of getting it, and the phone rings, and you had it. And... Uh, of course, Governor Hogan was most gracious, and well, I'm sure you've met him. Easy. I haven't actually met the governor. Really? Mm -mm. Easy going. What you see is what you get. Okay. <laughs> no, no fluff to him. Yeah. And I know that when you took over in 2015, there was at least a little bit of local controversy, because I think you were selected over um, a candidate who had come in first um, in votes over you, or not first in votes, but she had gotten more votes. Correct. And I mean, what was that like, you know, dealing with that, you know, as you're going or looking towards your first term as a delegate in Frederick County? Yeah, it was rough going uh, for a while. But then again, you know, that's the nature of the business. You know, if you can't stand that, don't don't go in. There was some uh, some... Some rough stuff that went down. I, I can understand the opposition. Uh, she got uh, four or five hundred votes more than I did. I think it was, yeah, six hundred and one. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll deal with six hundred and one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but she had been in the city council up there in um, Bel Air, not Bel Air, um, Mount, Mount Airy. Airy. Okay. And uh, she had a lot of exposure. I'm not criticizing her at all. She's she's turned out to be uh, quite an asset in the governor's cabinet. And um, so she had been campaigning more, and I had that brief period, and it, it happened the way it happened. Okay. And did that affect you at all going into your first term? Well, Kate, uh, I was, um, I, I decided that on that first term, I'm going to be seen and not heard too much, mm -hmm. because it had been a while since I'd been there on the floor, et cetera. So I, I um, made my made my pitches on the floor when I thought it was relevant, and uh, maintained a low-key uh, uh, position Oh, for a interesting. While. And what was that learning curve like, I mean, going into the State House, you know, I think maybe probably more than a decade after you had first entered? I was sworn in uh, by uh, the Speaker, obviously, and it's, it's an exhilarating thing to stand on that platform and look out and be sworn in, absolutely. And the House of Delegates is something that, if you've been there a while, you have just a warm, historical, emotional feeling about that place because it's the oldest existing uh, house, I believe, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't really get a state senate, to my knowledge, until much later on. Yeah. And as I tell my friends who are in the Senate, that's what loused everything up when you guys came on board. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was that. Okay. And politically, had things changed at all? I mean, in terms of tone or even, you know, the types of bills being passed? Yes and no. Okay. Sounds like a cop-out, but it's not. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be very candid, and this is my perspe perception. 
uh, it was a lot easier to talk to the, the guys and the ladies on the opposite side of the aisle back in 1995, 97 mm. than, uh, than today with some of them. There's just a, I'll be very blunt, there's just an, an arrogance to some of them and a coldness that they don't want to talk to you. And, and now that is not a general across the board statement because I know a lot of younger folks on the other other side and uh, you know we have coffee together in the mornings and things like that so it's not across the board but it's there. Okay, just in terms of the other legislators. Yeah, the older ones I've known them for years are most friendly. In, in fact, if I can share this with you, I sat for four years on the floor of the house with um, probably one of the most brilliant men I have ever met to my right. Mm -hmm. And believe me, he was not to my right. <laughs> Just had to sit there. Uh, Leon Billings, he's now dead. And it got to the point, Kate, where when a bill would come up, he'd say, uh, Celebrity, how are you going on this bill? I said, it's a stupid bill. Leon. <laughs> so that means I got to go for it, right? If you're voting no, I'm voting yes. <laughs> so that's the way it went for years. So this one time, we're out having some single malt scotch, which we had on occasion, midnight. And I said, Leon, let me ask you a question. You are probably one of the most brilliant men I've, I've, I've met, period. I said, how in the blazes can you vote the way you vote? He looked at me and he said, Barry, just because I'm bright doesn't mean I have good judgment. <laughs> <laughs> that ended it. <laughs> and was he also a Republican? Or was no, he, he was a Democrat. He was a Democrat. Yeah, was environmental lawyer. Okay, Great wow. Guy. Okay. But again, here's the point. You know, we were opposite politically, mm -hmm. but you know, very friendly and camaraderie, really. Yeah. And have you noticed, I mean, when you say coldness, do you mean more of a, a stratification between the parties? or? That's a good one. Probably, to some extent, yes. Again, this is my perception, but it is what it is from, from my perception. Right. Okay. And then going into the State House for your first term as a Frederick County delegate, what were some of your priorities? What did you want to accomplish? Well, at the first, at the first outset, I was uh, very much into signing on with uh, the tax cuts with uh, Governor Hogan. We're talking about 1995 now, or 2015. Yes. Yeah, okay. Signing on with the governor on, on the tax cuts, on, on seeing what we could to help deregulation where deregulation was an impediment, not a necessity. Uh, I, I wanted to do something with drunk driving, DUIs, mm -hmm. and a couple of other things, but that's, that's basically where we were at that point. But again, remember, we were 50, uh, 50 Republicans, 91 Democrats. So um, I can count. <laughs> and in committee, there would be, I think it's 16 of them, and uh, six, six or eight of us. Okay. So it was tough. Okay. And was there any legislation that you were able to pass? No. Okay. No. no. And last year, I don't think any Republican got, Republican got anything passed simply because it was an election year. And bluntly, I've been told they didn't want to make us look good. Mm. And again, that's just the way it goes. Politics is not all loves and kisses. <laughs> Well, going back to some of your legislation that I know didn't pass, but you mentioned drunk driving, and I know that's been sort of a perennial issue for you. Um, and can you go into some of the bills that you've proposed for that? Sure, I proposed them. DUI, excuse me, pardon me. Uh, one particular bill that I have now, it's being drafted. It's the uh, DUI f uh, for if you have minors in the car, mm -hmm. if you have babies in the car and you're pulled over and it's a DUI. Uh, the, the bill, actually, legislation exists right now on a DUI, obviously, but this uh, compounds it because it has the infant in the car component, and uh, the fine the fine doubles from 500, I think, to 1,000. Second offense, it's 1,000 to 2,000. Now, again, that's maximum. It's up to the judge to decide, but uh, we've had a number of people testify on that, uh, women from MAD, uh, and the, the alcohol group from Washington, D.C. comes up and testifies. And something just has to be done with that. Not only that, but I think drunk driving has moved over to second place to texting. Okay, texting. Uh, but that's where we are in the DUI. Okay, and is that a bill that you plan to introduce again Absolutely. this session? Yeah. Okay, and just to clarify, is this, when you say um, babies, is it literally for just infants or for all minors? Teenagers. Oh, well, up to, up to the point of a teenager. Okay. Yeah. You should be, well, you shouldn't be driving under the influence, period, but it compounds it when you've got your child in the back seat. Right, okay, so the penalties would increase if you're driving Absolutely. with a minor. Absolutely, definitely. The okay, and I, I mean, I was wondering, you know, because you've passed, I think, or not, or tried to pass two or three different, um, 
you know, drunk driving related initiatives. Um, and is it a personal issue for you or one that you have experience with? Uh, thank God, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, personally, no. I, in fact, since I, <laughs> the irony of that is, since I have put these bills in, I am very cautious when I am at one of my favorite bistros to limit myself to two drinks. Okay. And uh, if I don't think I'm right, I ask someone to drive me home because that would look very bad. <laughs> if a man pushing drunk driving is pulled over, not good. Right. Yeah. Well, the other type of bill that I've introduced this year is uh, for nurses. Mm -hmm. And um, Kate, they, they are in a bad situation. Uh, may I give you an example? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, po the policeman takes down somebody on the streets who's high on God knows, pick it out. Takes two of them, two police officers, to put this guy down, handcuff him, and then bring him into the, oper the emergency room, take the handcuffs off and walk away. Now there he is, I don't know, six feet, 200 pounds, and in walks this nurse at maybe 100 pounds. He gets violent, smacks her, curses at her, spits at her. They have no recourse. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty rough in these ERs. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled across that, and the nurses have been most cooperative in getting, getting the bill, uh, explaining to me why the bill was needed. Mm -hmm. So we've drafted it, and uh, it's in motion, but there are so many moving parts to this bill. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fire chiefs have to sign on, the police have to sign on, which I think they are, and uh, the state's attorneys have to take a look at it because some say they don't want to prosecute. Don't know why. That's what I've been told. I'm going to have to check that out. Okay. Yeah. And, and to be uh, clear, what exactly would the bill accomplish, or what is it It would out? place the nurses under uh, what we'd call uh, emergency responders. They would have all the protection by law. To, uh, to call the police and to take action. Okay, yeah. to take action against assaults in the emergency yeah. room? Yeah. Okay, and does it just extend to calling law enforcement or would they able, be able to then press charges against their press assaulter? Press charges, yes. Okay, press charges. Absolutely. Okay. Because now they're, they're limited to the best of my knowledge that they can do that. Okay, it, interesting. It's, it's not good. The other bill that I have is, uh, is the uh, adoption bill. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my sons is in the process of adopting. And uh, he's told me some of the um, pitfalls is the wrong word, but it's the red tape. And I've studied the, uh, the adoption laws in at least 35 states, and they vary. Mm -hmm. I mean, 35 states, 35 options. One state will say once the birth parent gives up the child, once that document is signed, that parent has, birth parent has no recourse to go in and get the child back and say, I've changed my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I can understand that. But... In other states, it's 30 days. Other states, 10 days. In Maryland, it's 30 days. Mm -hmm. And in my judgment, that's just too long for the mother then to decide to go in because the baby has now made an impression on the new, new parents. There's a bonding that goes on, obviously, in 30 days. Uh, but I have um, I've been um, challenged on that by a couple of adoption agencies uh, in, uh, in, in Annapolis. Mm. And they said 30 days is, is perfect. We don't want you to go to, two. I, I originally had it at 10 days, but then I compromised and said, how about 20? Mm -hmm. they, they came out and said, maybe, and then when they testified, they said no, and so I lost the bill. Okay, and just into, and so this was a bill that you introduced last year. I'm introducing it again. And you're reintroducing it, and mm -hmm. if I understand it, it would shorten the window of time that birth parents have to sort of um, change their mind correct. about adoption. And, and bring the child back. Okay. Re and Yes, correct. Okay, and you said that your son is going through the in, in adoption process, yeah. and that is that what inspired you to look into the well, bill? Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. He said, you know, Dad, there's so much red tape out there and so much of this and so much of that. I said, come on, it's an adoption. Mm -hmm. you, want, you want the baby? Obviously, the mother, for a lot of reasons, wants to heartfelt give it a good home because she can't for whatever reason. God bless her. So I, so I looked into it, and I realized, wow, 30 days, in my judgment, is too long. Too long to too have long. that window for a mother yeah. to change her mind. Correct. Okay. Because as I said, some states it's automatic. Mm -hmm. First day, gone, that's it. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And so are you basing this law off of any particular state or were you inspired by other legislation? I've looked at all, well, like I, I said about 35. Some states are uh, at 20. Some states are 35. As I said, some states are uh, five days. So I thought 10 would be good. Uh, I, was, I was told the adoption agencies would not go 10, so I want 20. But that hasn't worked yet. So I, I have a meeting set up with two adoption agencies to see what we can compromise on. Okay. And tell me a little bit, because you, you said you got some pushback from adoption agencies. So what is the pushback that you've been getting? Well, I'm going to try to reach back into what's left of my memory mm -hmm. to uh, <laughs> recall what we went through last year. And they said there are so many things that can happen. 
mm -hmm. with a, a, a an adoption, and within ten days, uh, basically it's um, it's too short a time to know if the fit is right. We it's too short a time to possibly uh, look into that second uh, second home and see if really if the uh, if the home is is ready for this child, if there's any potential abuse. And my response was, well, I assume you did that before you put the child up. And they said, well, yes, but things can go south on us. So that was one of their concerns. Okay. And I would assume that the, the role of the mother or the, the birth parents Con would also have a role. Oh, absolutely. You. Condition of her uh, abuse, a record of abuse, drug abuse, that kind of thing. Yeah. and Not then but, mention opiates. Yeah. But and even giving, but even given, you know, 10 days is sort of a short amount of time if someone wants to reconsider that decision. I, I understand that point. I do. Okay. And going back to the, the nurse bill as well, um, it was, you said that you stumbled across it, but it is such unique legislation, and I was wondering how you, know, you sort of got wind of that nurses were having this issue. Right. Well, uh, some friends of mine are nurses, and we were just happened, it was rather serendipitous. Uh, we were talking, and they said, you know, uh, delegates, you don't seem to understand. Not, that's not the right word. Uh, let me tell you some of the things that happened to our nurses. And when they started talking to me about the emergency room and uh, they, the exposure that they have, and there's very little recourse to what they can do. I said, holy smokes. So with that, I put the bill in. Okay. That's where we are. Okay. But as I said earlier, there's so many moving parts to that bill. And we have another meeting uh, next, well, this coming week to see what we can uh, iron out. Okay. Interesting. So it's, it's in motion, so okay, to speak. Okay, in motion. <laughs> <laughs> and so those are two bills that you want to push. And more broadly speaking, do you have any other legislative priorities this session? Yes. Food stamps. Okay. Uh, this has been done, I believe, at the federal level. I've got to check that out, but I believe it's true. In any event, I, in my judgment, uh, Kate, there's no reason why a, an able-bodied man or woman with no dependencies, children, uh, and they're on food stamps, can't look for work or volunteer work uh, at least 20 hours a week. Because if you're able-bodied, I mean able-bodied, uh, you shouldn't just simply be getting food five days a week and not attempting to get some work. It's, it's debilitating to the person. And besides, if you're working, it's, it's a pride issue. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's a self-esteem issue. So give them the opportunity to do that. Okay, so you'd like to attach a work requirement requirement to food stamps. Right, right. And, I mean, how would it look in real life? Because you mentioned, you know, possibly, like, at least searching for work or volunteering for work. I mean, how do you see it playing out? You'd have to uh, have a um, someone to, to report to. Okay. This was tried in uh, Garrett or Arig Allegheny County, I believe, by Neil Parrott. Mm -hmm. And he brought the, the bill to my committee, my committee, the committee I sat on, mm -hmm. appropriations, and he showed where they had produced this type of legislation and the number of people that, were winning, that had been on food stamps earlier dropped precipitously from, use the number 100, and it dropped down to about 15 because they'd found work. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. Work is better than welfare. Workfare is much better for a lot of reasons. So with that, I thought, well, we'll go statewide on and see what happens. Okay. But another thing is um, plastics. And another thing is uh, solar panels. Okay. Uh, what I have found out about the degree to which our um, landfills, our streams, and our oceans, especially the oceans, are being hammered with tons and tons of plastics. Uh, there's a, what do they call that thing, the Pacific uh, Ditch where the, uh, the plastics have gathered around in, because of the currents. Yeah, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, I think Excellent. it's called, right? Yeah. yeah, you should take my job. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly, the gar garbage patch, and it's mm -hmm. the size of Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not going to shrink. Uh, but some, some measures have to be taken to see what can be done. But well, the opposition to that's incredible. Really? The, the, you th in Maryland, there's yeah. opposition? Well, my, some of my people on my party say, what are you doing? You're going to hurt business. Oh. And I said, how can I hurt business? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if it takes a transition from plastic, let's do it. It's not that easy, obviously, mm -hmm. but certainly if you, don't, if you don't look at it and start with the first step, nothing's going to happen. Oh, that's interesting. And it seems like it's, explore, it's sort of exploratory for you right now. Yes. But what form? I mean, I know that, you know, in, in France, for example, they ban plastic bags. And I think that in California, they've done that as well. We hear a lot about plastic straws. So what, what type of legislation would you like to see in Maryland? 
I am going to be looking at those states that do have that kind of legislation because mm -hmm. right now I am I am in a uh, uh, the area has just opened up. I'm in shallow water. Okay. So I, don't want, I don't want to be specific because I, I I can't be. Okay. But things will happen. Okay. With respect to that, and another thing that has come across my desk is the and I know I'm getting myself in hot water with certain folks, but it is what it is. Solar panels. Mm -hmm. Now I had no um, second thoughts about solar panels. Until I read, and I've got three articles now. One of them is dated 19, uh, 2015, and my legislative aide is in the process of uh, updating some of these. The essence of it is, Kate, that some of these solar panels, uh, they uh, go by the wayside after X years. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what do you do with them? And the answer is, well, we're going to put them in landfills, really. Then I found out that there are certain chemicals within these uh, solar panels. Now, I'm dating this back five years. Maybe it's changed. If it hasn't, some of these chemicals are horrendous in these in these uh, solar panels, and they can break down and uh, into into the uh, uh, water. Uh, the, what am I trying to say here? Yeah. Into our water streams. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's to me that's that's got to look got to be looked at. Okay, that's interesting. And so solar panels panels that corrode and then are thrown out with the chemicals in them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I don't know if the, if the 2019 ones are new and improved mm -hmm. or it's the same problem. But okay. We're working on it. Okay. And would those two environmental bills be something that you would want to submit this session? The uh, plastics, uh, I'm going to have to do something, obviously, by the 25th. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I, if, if I can get a, a good piece of legislation drafted by the bill drafters that makes sense, uh, I'll put one of them in or both. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Now, the question is how many are going to co-sign that? Yeah. Well, and that's interesting. So do you expect resistance from within your own party on environmentally? Well, I'm going to get resistance across the board from both parties, certain elements within each party. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll see. In fact, I'll give you a call. See how, okay. see how good it's going. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> okay, will do. <laughs> well, and I wanted to also talk about two bills that I know that you have um, at least submitted in the past that do seem, you know, to be pretty um, partisan. And I, one of them was a bill. I'm going to look at my notes just to make sure I don't get it incorrect. But the Pain Capable Unborn Child Act. I was going to mention that. Yeah, and I, I wa was wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about that and what that legislation would do. Sure. If you had a pin right now, P-I-N, mm -hmm. and you pierced your skin, mm -hmm. your, your, one of your fingers, you'd feel pain. Right. Concomitantly, a baby in the womb at age 20 weeks can feel pain. Now, when I found that out, I examined it and uh, called a few of the doctors, and they said absolutely. So when I pr presented that bill last year, it was just it wasn't just me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing I did was testify before the committee in terms of this is the bill. Now, I have four doctors behind me, three nurses, mm -hmm. well, it was three doctors, three nurses, and a number of people who have had children who uh, had to be operated on within the womb uh, to testify. And they did. And I thought the testimony was was shaking, mm -hmm. but it didn't go anywhere. Okay. because that committee, bluntly put, does not want to hear that bill. And what committee is that? Health bill, health oh, committee. Okay, and the bill would essentially um, prohibit abortions past 20 weeks of gestation. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, yeah. and I do have to point out that the American College of uh, um, Gynecologists and Obstetricians does argue that pain in utero starts around the third trimester. So it's later than 20 weeks. They say that it's around 27 to 29. And then, of course, most abortions in the United States are performed at 20 to 21 weeks. They're entitled to that, but the doctors that I had testified, from, uh, obstetricians on up and down, mm -hmm. testified that at 20 weeks, okay. this is just not one doctor. These were three doctors mm -hmm. uh, with very, very substantial credentials, and they said 20 weeks. So it's out there to be debated, I guess. Yeah. And so you, you co-signed or at least pushed this bill or presented it in committee, and is that something you plan to reintroduce this session? That is uh, up for grabs because somebody else had suggested that uh, since we did it last year and it didn't go very far, uh, maybe you want to consider backing off this year. Okay. And Kate, right now it's under consideration because okay. the bill's drafted. I just don't know if I want to uh, push it at this point. Okay. And I think it was it might be a similar situation, but you did at least introduce um, or co-sign on legislation that would have, I think it's just formed a committee, but reinvestigate the introduction of the death penalty back into Maryland? 
Yes. Okay. And can you tell me about that and why you wanted to do that? Sure. I think some of the crimes that are committed outside those windows, mm -hmm. some of those crimes are horrific. I mean, just, in my judgment, the people that commit these crimes, multiple murders, cold-blooded attacks on, on the wife, the children, cold-blooded attack on a, in a movie theater, they, they, they reached a point of being so egregious that in my judgment, they should not, they should not be with us. Mm -hmm. They would be better off in the next dimension, which, wherever they go, up or down. So, uh, yes, I, I would reintroduce that. Okay. And is that something that you would like to reintroduce this session? A uh, study. Okay. A study. Study. And how did it go the first time? Not very well. Not very well. What yeah. pushback did you get? Uh, silence. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, it's, uh, that can hurt. How, how, how are we doing on this bill? Uh, we'll let you know. Mm -hmm. Translator means we'll call you. Don't call us. Yeah. So. But to me, uh, many, many uh, states have the death penalty. Uh, I, I'm leery of it from the standpoint of uh, putting somebody who's innocent to death, obviously. Mm -hmm. But once you've got the DNA mm -hmm. solidly, irrefutably, uh, and he, is, he or she's committed these hellacious or egregious crimes, my judgment is the death penalty. Okay. I guess I was just interested, you know, because Maryland is known for being, you know, such a liberal state in that regard in terms of both abortion and the, abortion and the death penalty. Absolutely correct. So I wonder, you know, why try to introduce bills that don't really have a good chance of passing? Sure. Good question. Uh, arouse, awaken, and lift, this, lift that issue up to a point of having an intelligent discussion. Okay. And w what will happen? I don't know. But mm -hmm. at least raise the issue and let's talk about it. Okay. And I wanted to ask, you know, it's because you mentioned some environmental um, bills that you'd be interested, interested in pursuing, and then you submitted the two bills that we just talked about. And so I was wondering, in terms of conservatism and, you know, the Republican Party, do you consider yourself, um, you know, a conservative Republican, or where do you think that you fall on that spectrum? Uh, well, I begin with the fact that I consider myself a Christian, though flawed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> um, an American constitutional Republican, uh, and um, I have voted across party lines on occasion. Mm -hmm. But um, I am a small government guy, I'm a less taxes guy, I'm a pro-business person. It's, uh, it, it boils down to, not to oversimplify this, it's going to be either we the people or we the government. Mm -hmm. And I have traveled enough around the world a couple times to see government in action. And when government takes over food, clothing, and shelter, I'll guarantee to you, you're going to have a shortage of food, clothing, and shelter. Mm -hmm. I've been to the Soviet Union. I've been behind the Iron Curtain into several other the the uh, satellites, the satellites that they had, and it's tragic. Mm -hmm. It's tragic. Just let people alone, and they will take care of these problems. Okay. With certain you know, restrictions. Okay. And do you support the Trump presidency? Is that something that, on the national level, um, you know, you've been watching and supporting? When Trump gave his second speech, talking about the the border and what's coming across that border. Is this I, his, in, in, when he was running? When he, when he began. When he began yeah. as a candidate. I turned to my wife, I was sitting on the couch, I said, uh, Pam, I don't know who the guy is, I heard the name Trump, I know he owns everything in the world, but what he just said is a home run for me, I like this guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put myself in as a candidate for the nominating convention in Cleveland, won and I was there. Okay. Yeah. So to answer your question, I'm very much pro-Trump. Okay. Uh, he is the only one, bluntly put, who could have won against Hillary, mm -hmm. in my judgment. So, okay. We may disagree on that, but <laughs> it is what it no, is. No, I was just curious. <laughs> and I wanted to focus on some local legislation as well, because I know that, um, you know, when the delegation, when the Frederick County delegation met, um, some of the priorities that were put in front of you guys um, were related to infrastructure and transportation. Mm -hmm. And one, of course, was the I-270 project, the proposed um, private-public partnership right. to widen those lanes. And I was wondering if you had thoughts on that or, or plan to support that. It's kind of ironic because I used to be on appropriations and now I'm on environment and transportation. Okay. So I've got a learning curve here, but I'll handle it. Uh, no, 270 is a, it has got to be widened. There's no question about it. So then you have the issue of tolls. And I know that's not very popular, but Virginia's done a good job with it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something to look into, the, the toll roads. Okay. And also, if I may point this out, we spend a lot of money on these... Um, Tra these uh, transportation issues, uh, subways and all that. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that they could divert some of that money because when you talk about rail, uh, the railroads and transportation in that area, 
uh, ridership is not all that heavy. So the question is, why do you need more and more money for it? And of course, I realize the hue and cry out there among some people is, we need more rail. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've listened to that. But when the ridership doesn't support the argument, next question is, why not divert some of that money to, to uh, roads? Okay. Of course, their counter, their counter argument is, well, the more roads you build, then obviously right. we're going to have more <laughs> development. Okay, I got it. Okay, but as for right now, you, you'd rather focus on the roads in terms of a concrete solution. Yeah, especially 270. Okay. And I know that there was some hope within at least the city of Frederick that this delegation might change um, its current stance um, as a unit on the proposed uh, downtown hotel conference center. What's um, that again? The, the proposed... I never heard you. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm serious. Yeah. I, well, do you, I mean, have you, how have your, or have your ideas or, you know, concept of that shifted over the past few years as the project continues to be pushed? The project's dead. You think it's dead? Oh, absolutely. I had a, the opportunity, uh, the mayor, O'Connor, Mike, great guy, mm -hmm. good mayor, really, and uh, the head of the uh, uh, tourism, I believe, for Frederick, he, the, the, uh, O'Connor called me and he said, can we talk about this, or don't you want to talk about it? It, the hotel. Mm -hmm. I said, fine, let's talk. So I was there for about an hour. And uh, it was not contentious. It was sh shared views. And they told me, they said, in effect, we're going to get a positive move from the delegation. I said, okay. I'm not sure where that crystal ball came from. But once you do that, then Governor Hogan is going to endorse it. And I said, best of my knowledge, I said, folks, I really don't want to be a a skunk at the garden party, uh -huh. but that ain't happening. Okay. Uh, the Frederick De delegation now will probably break 4-4 because we lost a Republican. But I said, Governor Hogan has no intentions of pu pushing tax money for a hotel. Well, it's, the, the tax money does go towards infrastructure on the well, it hotel. it goes toward the, the uh, uh, parking under, under the hotel. Mm -hmm. And that's, without that parking, there wouldn't be the hotel. Okay. So Governor Hogan has issued his budget and there's no money in it for the hotel. Okay. And do you think it's an important project for Frederick? Because I know that, you know, obviously Frederick City a lot of times is thought as one of the crown jewels of Frederick County. True. Part of Frederick County falls under your district. True. Um, and well, many... Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and a lot of people in the city want to see this project come to fruition because they argue that it would boost, you know, the economic development in the city. Do you agree with that? Some point of it. My, my argument has been, look, if this hotel is so valuable, mm -hmm. if this hotel is so important, why, why is it that you don't have a number of investors in there? I mean, Randy Cohen is doing a fantastic job with his uh, revamping his, his, position, his uh, hotel mm -hmm. and conference center without a single taxpayer dollar. Uh, there's, an, there's a convent, and I just read in the paper, that's being converted into condominiums and hotel and yeah, a hotel. the Second Street um, Former Girls School. Yeah, I Former Girls School, Catholic correct. Visitation. And they're not asking for a single penny. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe Randy is in the process of putting a, a um, Marriott close to the city, not necessarily in the city. Again, no tax money. So I'm not into this uh, crony capitalism stuff. Okay. So you argue that the developer should be responsible for... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If, if, if it's not good enough for the developer, why should the taxpayer be on the hook? Okay. And I wanted to ask you about opioids as well, because I know at least in an introductory article during... Um, your campaign, you mentioned that it would be a priority for you, or you did see it as a priority. And I mean, what are your stance, you know, or what is your stance on the opioid epidemic? Yeah, you know, somebody wrote a letter about that. Yeah. <laughs> and either I mis, mis, misquoted, I, I, I was, uh, well, he, either he misunderstood what I said, or I said possibly that I, I was uh, confused on the issue. Yeah. Not confused, but misunderstood. No, opiates is the number one issue, my mm -hmm. God. Yeah, and I, I think the letter that you were men like were referring to, um, he mentioned that at least we quoted you as saying that you thought of opioid as a priority, but you thought there was not a lot that the state could do to help fight the epidemic. Yes, good point. And what I was referring to there was, you can spend double what we're spending now, especially in treatment, which I have no problem with, the facilities to, to, uh, to help them out. But Kate, from my position, that discussion on opiates begins at the dining room table with the parents. Okay, that's one point. The second point is schools. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask any kid today, what about tobacco? Oh, it's dangerous. I mean, that's all, it's almost axiomatic. Mm -hmm. So my point has been, as, as that second tier, 
uh, starting in kindergarten or first grade, opiates should be a number one uh, thou shalt not. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous, it can kill you. And if they have that message starting in kindergarten or first grade, all the way up through uh, middle school, that should have the same impact on these kids as the smoking issue would. Mm -hmm. That's where I was going with that. Okay. And so does that mean, I mean, would you support then bills that would introduce more education into schools? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. And is there any other, you know, specific opioid legislation that you've considered or looked at this coming session? Prevention and then treatment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, just general t bills tackling those two issues? Well, I would support them. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, excuse me. I'm sure they're out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I know I, I wanted to check because I know that, you know, business is, is another big part of your slate. Um, and have you co-signed on any business bills so far this session, or do you plan to introduce anything for small business owners? No, I'm not going to introduce it, but I believe uh, one of the bills I co-signed a couple days ago from Governor Hogan's office dealt with the issue of more, uh, a more careful review of regulations that impact on business mm -hmm. and giving businesses a, a, a better tax break, so to speak. So okay. on those two issues, yes, very okay. much so. Okay. Well, business is the backbone. We are, America is business mm -hmm. with certain curtailments, of course. Yeah. I mean, Rockefeller's always praised and then condemned because, you know, he was uh, Mr. Oil and he dominated the, the oil industry. But um, people seem to forget that uh, Rockefeller, because he dropped the price of kerosene, everybody could now afford kerosene lamps in their homes. At that point, we didn't have to destroy whales to get the whale oil to produce the uh, necessary oil for the, for the lamps. Hmm. Nobody gives him credit for that. Interesting. Yeah, he saved the whales. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking forward, is there any other um, legislation or are there any other priorities of yours that we might have missed? No, I think you've uh, you hit a home run here. Okay. Well, we've talked a lot about politics, um, but I also wanted to let people get to the, or give people the chance to let to get to know you a little bit more personally. Um, so I was wondering if just to start off, you could talk about your family a little bit and tell me about them. Well, why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, we I've got two wonderful daughters and three incredibly great guys. Mm -hmm. And there's the DNA on one is not the DNA on the other, and it sure as heck not the DNA on a third. They are who they are. Uh -huh. And I love them dearly. They're all, you know, they, they're doing well. They're successful, but the point is they're good family people. Mm -hmm. When I say good family people, they, my sons enjoy being around each other. Mm -hmm. They enjoy being with the family. That includes me, believe it or not. And, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Pam. Uh, so it's a, it's a wholesome atmosphere. Okay. And we don't always agree. There's no question about that. We have some rather heated discussions. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. About you know, what? Oh, my gosh. As I say, it's not a carbon copy out there. Okay. And they want to know why I am so, uh, so hepped up on this and don't I understand uh, this. And I said, well, especially one of my daughters. She doesn't think I am really sufficiently, I think that's, that's Rachel, sufficiently attuned to the environment. Okay. She wants me to, to be more pro-environment. I said, I'm almost a tree hugger. <laughs> so I, was, I was a conservationist before it was, before it was cool to be a conservationist. <laughs> so we disagree on that. But okay. In general, it's a, it, it's a wonderful uh, family. Uh, unfortunately, we lost a daughter about a year and a half ago. So. Oh, I'm uh, so sorry to hear that. Yeah. That's, I'll tell you, at the age of 29, it's... When she decided to to leave, uh, it's had a devastating impact. She she left the family, or she committed suicide. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, I shouldn't have brought that up. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. Don't apologize yeah. at all. And um, of course, it's had an impact, obviously, on on her mother, Pam. Yeah. And uh, it bothers me sometimes too, quite quite deeply, when I'm driving alone. Mm -hmm. Of course, always that question, Kate: What could we have done, you know, to prevent it? Yeah. And the answer is not. You can't. Yeah. It's the darkness of uh, depression. Right. And I never, never really understood depression until that. Yeah. Yeah. But that aside, and not to say that's an aside, mm -hmm. uh, the family is, is well, they're wholesome, uh, we, we, we have a great time together. Yeah. And you mentioned that your, um, was it your youngest daughter, Rachel? She sort of gets on you about the environment. She's the older of the two. Oh, the older yeah. of the two. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So have they modified your political leanings at all? Or have you, I mean, do you live <laughs> having young millennial kids? Uh, I listen. 
because they they will have they will not hear anything else but you will listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, my younger daughter Catherine is um, she's very much into nutrition, mm -hmm. and she wonders why I'm not. <laughs> and I told her I said, look, the shape I'm in at my age, sweetheart, I know nutrition. Leave me alone. <laughs> So we uh, we have some interesting discussions and debates on the nutrition issue. Okay. But again, it's it's open and, and, and great. Yeah, absolutely. I also wanted to ask you something. I was going back in our archives, and I saw that we ran an article in 2005 that you had actually volunteered in Iraq as a consultant for the U.S. State Department um, and over like helped oversee the elections there. And I thought that uh, was very interesting. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about that. Yes. My... My son, my youngest boy, Eric, was at that time working in the West Wing in the mm -hmm. White House. And uh, he emailed me and he said, Dad, they're looking for people who have political experience, especially politics and elections. Uh, would you be interested in serving in Iraq? I said, get serious. <laughs> he said, well, I'll, I'll send you the link. He did. I opened it up. I looked at it. And I called him back. I said, look, I know all about elections. Mm -hmm. I have been elected rejected and selected. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, let me clear it with the House and Senate over here and see what's going to be. So make a long story short. I went through all the paperwork, et cetera, and they selected me. So I went over in November of 04, which was a horrible mistake because that put me away from my family at Christmas, oh, no. which was a one-sided deal. Now, now, I'll never forget Christmas morning, Kate. I'm sitting in the Saddam's palace, the green zone, uh -huh. sipping a hot cup of coffee mm -hmm. from a styrofoam cup, mm -hmm. plastic. <laughs> and I'm saying, celebrity, what, what ails you? Here you are, it's raining outside, miserable weather. You're over here in this godforsaken place and your family's home. What were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> that passed. Yeah. But uh, th that election that we were involved in was absolutely probably one of the most inspiring mm -hmm. Some, some of the most emotional components that I've been through. Yeah, and what, at the time, what was so inspiring about it? The very fact this would be the first time the Iraqis had an a, a, a chance to be involved in a honestly free election. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to put that together? And I'll, I'll never forget, uh, I was working with the chief of staff, and I had a very fancy title, mm -hmm. deputy to the chief of staff. Okay. <laughs> I didn't throw it around much, but <laughs> except for my buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Buy me a drink, I'm the deputy. <laughs> no. And uh, I, I remember he said, his name was Leo, he said, uh, Barry, go down and check out what they're doing in this conference room on, on elections. I said, okay, it's my job. Mm -hmm. November 22nd, I'll never forget it, 2004, I walked in, sat down. They did not have candidates. They did not have voting sites. They did not have any literature to run on. They, they were in a, a quandary is a light word. Mm -hmm. I mean, things were upside down. And I went back to, to uh, Leo. I said, Leo, I don't see this. If I were going to be elected or run for office at the end of January, and by November 22nd, I hadn't had my literature together, it'd be sayonara, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. They pulled it together. Miraculously, they pulled it together. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget the night before the election, we had a final briefing. And um, we estimated that of the 5,000 election sites, my gosh, where's this coming from? 5,000 election sites. If we lost 200 of them, 250, they were bombed, et cetera, we'd be lucky. And if we lost about 10,000 people going to the polls, this would be a success. Wow. Yes, that's what I thought. Dear God. And here we worry about in the States if it's raining. Mm -hmm. you know, it's too cold, it's too hot, it's raining. And so we went to bed, or I went to bed that night with those, that, that, I didn't sleep well with that on my skull. At the end of the day, we did not lose a single election site. We took some rifle fire from one site, killed a couple people, and of the 14,000 people we thought were going to die, I think 148 died. Wow. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget, the day before, mm -hmm. they said, are there any other questions? Oh, no, about a week before the election. I said, are there mm -hmm. any other questions? And I raised my hand. I said, well, General, uh, what's going to stop a car loaded with C4 or whatever, TNT, mm -hmm. from driving straight on into these things? And I'll never forget, one of the foreign generals leaned over and he says, that's a ridiculous question. <laughs> I said, really? Bombs going off in a car in downtown Iraq, that's ridiculous? Mm -hmm. He laughed. The irony of that was, two days before the election, the Ministry of the Interior came out and said, oh, by the way, there will be no cars on these roads unless you have a special permit. Oh, wow. Otherwise, okay. lethal force authorized. Mm. And that means they'll shoot. 
So I just turned to the uh, general. I said, uh, we were discussing loaded cars. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that, was, that was just inspiring. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And have you been, have you traveled other places or outside the country at all um, since then or before then? Well, during that time, we went to uh, Amman, Jordan, mm -hmm. to see the Iraqi, Iraqi police uh, Iraqi, Iraqi police force sworn in, mm -hmm. 1,500 of them. Okay, wow. That was inspiring. Um, so I've, I've been to Israel, been to uh, Iraq, obviously, and uh, Jordan. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating places, obviously. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, Delegate, I also have a few rapid-fire questions for you. Yes if or no? If you're ready. Um, you, you can take, they can be beyond yes or no, but you just answer them off the top of your head. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Well, let me get my tie straight. Okay. <laughs> well, the first one is pretty easy, and it's just whether you are a dog person or a cat person. Dog. Dog? Certainly. Okay. Do you have any dogs at home? I have two Boston Terriers. Oh, really? What are their names? Augustus Caesar. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously Cleopatra. Are they really? Yes. Did you name them after the Shakespeare? I was in Iraq uh -huh. in, in 05, and uh, I got a call from one of my daughters saying, Dad, we just bought a dog. Wow, uh -huh. like, <laughs> like big dogs. I said, great, there's a picture of it. It's this big. <laughs> yeah. What's this? I said, Dad, you'll love him. And we named him Augustus Caesar. Okay. In your honor. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, four or five years later, uh, Pam's out shopping and she drops into one of these uh, uh, pet mills, I guess they were, and she called me. She said, I have just found the answer to Gus. I said, what's that? She said, Cleopatra. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, you, And do you call her Cleo? So is it Gus and Cleo? Cleo. Okay. Yes. That's cute. Very intelligent. Very intelligent female. Yeah. <laughs> well, and what about pie or cake? Are you a pie person or a cake person? Cake, according to the scales. Okay. <laughs> Do you have a favorite cake? It's got to be chocolate. Okay. Just chocolate cake. Chocolate. Okay. You, you've won me over. Okay. <laughs> and then this one is a little more complicated, but I was wondering if you could have dinner with three people, living or dead, what are the three people or who are the three people you would have dinner with? John Wayne. Okay. Donald Trump. Okay. And my dad. Okay. And why those three? I've always admired Duke. Okay. <laughs> when I was growing up, he was one of the heroes, right? Yeah. And I obviously admire Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and I miss my dad. Okay. That's it. Okay. And when was the last time you saw your dad, or when did he pass? He, he passed in 68. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Do you think the three of them would all get along? Oh, yes. Yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Without a question. Okay. And this sort of, my next question is not a completely related, but I was wondering if you have a favorite book of all time. Oh, my. There are several. You could always name the Bible, okay. obviously, as many people would do. Um, Solzhenitsyn's book, it, Ar Archipelago, the, the Gulag Archipelago. Okay. I haven't read that one. Uh, he's, he, well, it's his story of being in the slave labor camps of the Soviet Union. Mm, interesting. That's one of them. There are so many out there, but uh, that's one. Okay. And then what about movies? If you had to take three movies onto a desert island, which three movies would you choose? Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Three movies, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, The Magnificent Seven. Okay. Patton. And Patton. No, <laughs> <laughs> no uh, Magnificent Seven, Patton, and um, uh, I guess something from a, a nice comedy with uh, Dean Martin okay. and Frank Sinatra. Okay. I don't even... I can't think of a single comedy with Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra. When they get together, it's a comedy. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they have a story, but within that, there's, there's miles of laughs. Okay. Okay. And then you mentioned earlier um, on in our interview, you mentioned drinking single malt scotch. But I also wanted to ask, I mean, is that your alcoholic drink of choice? Or, and if not, what is? Okay. Just between the two of us. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to lose weight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a good buddy of mine is also in that same predicament, but mm -hmm. he switched to, to just straight vodka. Okay. You know, uh, well, a couple of ice cubes and some water. Uh -huh. I said, why'd you do that? He said, because I've lost about four or five pounds. I said, and you're attributing that directly to vodka? <laughs> I said, yep. So, Kate, last night when I was watching the football games, I had a sip of wine and just a tad, 
I emphasize a tad, uh -huh. of vodka. Okay, so you've switched now. You've gone from brown I'm to I'm going to give it a liquors. shot and see what the scale says. Okay, and what do your taste buds say? Like, are you a fan? Well, scotch is not what you, I mean, uh, there I go. Uh, vodka is not like scotch right. or a good bourbon, so mm -hmm. it's semi-tasteless. But there's a method to my madness here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I know that you mentioned that you and your family live um, in Urbana. Great, um, correct. But do you have a Frederick, um, or do you have a favorite restaurant in the Frederick area that you like to go to? I can't answer that. I got in trouble. No, you have to tell me. I don't have to tell you. It, you yeah, you have to tell me. I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Well, there's Monocacy Crossing. Okay. Comma, Il Porto, comma. Uh huh. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Manalu. Man, oh, th that's the one that's actually not far from here, is exactly. it? Exactly. Right. In fact, I'm supposed to meet folks over there for lunch. Okay. The one, a very fine Italian restaurant run by a Sicilian. Mm -hmm. And um, Mangio Bevy. Okay. Now I got myself covered. I okay. Mean, nobody's going to mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the only other question I have for you, Delegate, is, um, and I've been asking everyone this, but whether there are any items um, on your bucket list that you have not crossed off yet, but you really want to do. Yes. And I've been told by one of my sons that uh, that train has left the station. Okay. So, well, thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I, I like to climb. It's Pikes Peak, and I've climbed a couple others. But I've, I've, always wanted to be, I've always wanted to have the opportunity to say that I was at Base Camp Everest, which is 21,005. Yeah. But I think that train's left the oh, station. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I've made it up to 17,000. Wow. And, uh, it's, there's no air up there. Yeah. Very little. Uh, I may try Pikes Peak one more time, seriously. Okay. And uh, was that the highest peak you've climbed? Yeah. 18, 17.5 was. I had to quit. Wow. Well, actually, my son was with me. I had my two sons with me. One uh, bailed out at 12. He got uh, altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. it always, they always say, you know, that the more athletic you are, the less chance you're going to have because you think you're Superman mm -hmm. and you're going to run this thing. It doesn't work. So he bailed out at 12,000. Chris did. And Steve and I made it up to about 16,000, 16,500 something. And he said, Dad, I'm starting to see double. Oh, no. I said, okay, that's not good. At the same time, our guide had a lamp and the lamp went out. Oh, and no. It was dark. And the, 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 guard, the, the guide said, there's not to worry about. We, we will take you up. I said, well, Okay, number one, my, my son's seat double. Number two, the lamp's out. And number three, it's dark. Uh -huh. And we got another 1,500 feet to go, or 2,000. I said, that's not going to happen. Okay. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> so I turned around and went back. Okay, but you might try it one more time? I might, depending on you know, which part of the brain is working, the <laughs> rational or emotional. Right. All right. Well, Delicate, thank you so much for coming in this afternoon and speaking with me. I appreciate not at all. it. Not at all.